Well, first of all, thanks very much indeed for the most um, informative and insightful uh, morning. Uh, my name is Andrew Leung. I'm a China strategist, but I have many, many years in Hong Kong, uh, also as a, a high-ranking government official. But I've never been in education, so I handed over my job twice to Carrie Lam, first at, as Director General of Social Welfare, and secondly in London. But anyways, um, and not my background, but my question is more in a global context. Um, because after all, we're talking about technology, um, and then as uh, was referred to before, uh, inequality. Um, so uh, in spite of the productivity increases, uh, the kind of education, uh, so my question is that how is um, the um, very probable reduction of the number of jobs because of the impact of technology is going um, to be resolved, um, like it or not? I mean, even though there are more and more people uh, being um, educated on technology and so on and so forth, the total number of jobs are likely to reduce. Um, and then as more people come into the job market, um, so how are you going to address this phenomenon? Um, now, the, in the earlier uh, presentation, uh, even though the total global of jobs is not um, affected that much, this is mainly offset um, by the number of traditional jobs uh, of the emerging market economies. These are not tech jobs, they're not high tech jobs, right? But in terms of the total of jobs, um, unless uh, the entire world sort of embraces the, the kind of level of productivity, um, so it's likely to be a great impact. And so how are you going to resolve that? And secondly, uh, inequality, um, not just because of the, um, the kind of jobs, but because of the, uh, uh, the tilt towards capital as illustrated by Thomas Piketty's um, seminal work, Capital in the 21st Century. Whereas you can, the, the kind of economy being uh, captured more by capital, especially in high tech, you need a lot of um, you know, capital investment in research and that kind of thing. Um, so it is bound to lead to greater inequality, uh, as I said, um, as exemplified by the you know, almost 100 years of data uh, in Thomas Piketty's book. Uh, capital in the 21st century. So two issues uh, in the group of context, the uh, impact of technology on the total number of jobs uh, in the long term. Secondly, uh, the question of inequality. So how are these two issues going to be resolved? Uh, maybe I'll, I'll start first. So on the first issue of jobs, um, I'm actually more optimistic perhaps than you. I think there are large sectors that are severely underprovided currently. Uh, uh, and these are not the high and uh, high tech sectors where uh, new jobs will be coming. These are actually relatively low tech, uh, home care, uh, old age care, basically what currently is uh, uh, either not provided at all or family members provide. I can imagine a number of jobs that are already being created in some of the richer countries, um, uh, but a lot more can be done in these countries and essentially do not exist in middle income and, uh, and uh, poor countries. So if you like social jobs, so not just about producing goods, but also how to provide for better living for um, uh, for the um, elderly, for the um, sick, and so on. So I think there is an enormous uh, number of, uh, of such uh, uh, jobs that can uh, expand. And even in the social field, there are some jobs that we have not imagined because society hasn't developed to the point where we think these are worthy of, um, of, uh, of the economy. So I think then my prediction is, unlike many, uh, that I think the number of jobs are going to continue expanding for considerable number of, um, of years. The second point on inequality, I think, is more worrisome. And indeed, uh, this report has been um, criticized for being too optimistic. We've made the point that we're just reporting on standard measures of uh, income inequality that currently exist uh, in economics, so Gini coefficients, the share of top 10 or top 5 or top 20 relative to the rest of the population and so on. And on these measures, with the exception of very few countries, US and UK happen to be among these countries, 
um, uh, to relate to the Piketty's um, uh, to the Piketty's book. But in the majority of countries around the world, at least in the last 15 years, it's not true that on standard measures inequality is rising. Now one can go to much more um, sophisticated measure and saying, well, it's not about the top 10 percent; it's the top uh, one or the top half percent. Um, uh, and then these are the people where capital more and more gets uh, uh, gets accumulated, and they get fabulously rich. And that there seems to be some evidence um, on that uh, happen, uh, happening that Piketty and other people like that collect. The issue with that, and we do document somewhat in the report, although there is not good enough data, is that we cannot get to the incomes, to the true income of these people because it's parked in the Bahamas, Luxembourg, uh, and, and so on. So it's not a measure that you really can, I mean, by definition, they're hiding a lot of, um, of that. So we try to do some uh, back of the envelope calculations, not on individuals, but on firms. So, f for example, one of the big... Uh, complainers on our report has been Google. So they were sending one team after another to say this is ridiculous, we pay taxes, we're very responsible people and so on. So we've been pushing them, okay, tell us your global tax. So how much do you globally pay uh, tax? And they come up with some numbers that look truly ridiculous even for non-economists. So you start sort of uncoupling it and we have a number in this report. So Google globally last year paid something like let's be generous, 1% of, uh, of uh, corporate income tax globally. So in some countries they pay more, in some countries they pay nothing. So, But globally, at least our calculation, which probably is incorrect, but probably not uh, order of magnitude, about 1%. Well, the average mandatory um, corporate income tax rate in OECD countries is around 23%. This is after Trump reduced uh, one, uh, the one in the US. So 23. So it makes, let's say, not everybody pays 23. But OECD countries, on average, corporations pay around 16, seems to be. So if you pay 16 and Google comes and says that they're responsible global citizens and they pay less than one, clearly this money is going somewhere and it's going in the main shareholders of Google. Uh, so I think that uh, issue that you, uh, that you raise becomes very relevant there. Unfortunately, so far at least, unless we can reinvent and reimagine the global tax regime, we cannot capture that. And we cannot capture in terms of how much it is, and more importantly for this discussion, it's income inequality, but it's also political inequality, because one issue is what do you do with this money? If it's just parked there, it's annoying, it's unequal, but okay, maybe it's fine. But if you decide to use this money to affect policy, government policy, on competition, on taxation, which Google does do. I mean, Google does a lot of lobbying on not regulating in certain um, areas because it's too early um, to regulate. So clearly you, you distort, uh, distort outcomes. But maybe Simon knows more about this, uh, <laughs> this topic or he's not allowed to comment. It is, I mean, I hope you don't mind me saying this, it's, it's very interesting um, to hear you talking like this because you know, you're you known for many things, but one of the things you're, you're, you're principally known for are the doing business reports, which are all about making life easier for businesses so that they can create jobs uh, and improve productivity. And you know, here you are talking um, with great passion about uh, the dangers of this kind of uh, tax shifting. Um, I, I don't know if there's been a sort of Damascene conversion for you uh, along the way, or, or um, whether you see these sort of two uh, incarnations of um, Simon Dyankov as entirely compatible? <laughs> this, is the journalist. this is the journalist asking you a question. Uh, it's somewhat of a surprise uh, to me as well, Simon, to, to suddenly be considered left wing rather than the typical this is a right wing guy, beware. Um, but, but I see a real issue with it. So, one is the income inequality issue that uh, and, and and what this can uh, uh, can uh, bring what worries me is the latter part that i mentioned that if you have a lot of and i we've seen historically this uh, this play out if you have a lot of money and you decide to use it to what you may think is a good uh, 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 good purpose, uh, but turns out to be bad purpose, or you intentionally decide to use it for a bad purpose, for example, to stifle competition, uh, which I think a lot of the uh, online platform companies are in fact actively doing, well, that's an issue. Then 
I do care about businesses to develop, but I don't care about Amazon or Google to develop and basically kill everybody else. Which you can do if you, you know, if I don't pay any tax and everybody else is paying taxes, you know, it doesn't seem to be right. So my views are evolving. I'm not sure where I'll end up. Are there any other questions? Yes. Thank you. My name is Andy, Andy Wong. I work for the ICAW Institute of Chartered Accountant in England and Wales. Qu a question for you, please. Um, you mentioned that the industrial jobs is actually not going, sifting through uh, from China to the East Asian countries to African countries and the low income countries. Um, could you elaborate on that? And also, the other thing I just wanted to, to mention is that um, do you see the uh, changing of the nature of the work also means that uh, the workforce will be increasingly more mobile. For example, you know, if the jobs are not going to those countries, will the labor from those countries to the uh, kind of a, the, the more kind of manufacturing base in other countries or the service sector like the aging population in Japan? Thank you. Um, so uh, as perhaps Simon uh, attested somewhat, we've tried to be relatively courageous in this report, but our courage sort of stops uh, at a certain level. So we studiously avoided the topic of migration or immigration so that we are not uh, uh, attacked too much on, <laughs> on it because it is a big topic. And if you read this report, it actually comes to the natural conclusion that since in uh, a number of countries, uh, uh, they don't seem to have the environment for creating uh, enough jobs, which is demonstrated by the share of informality being very high. If you have human capital accumulated somehow in these countries, probably the best thing for you is to pack and move to one of the countries where you do have the uh, infrastructure that allows you to, um, uh, to use your skills to their best potential. Of course, if we said that, the report wouldn't have been published, which is, um, um, uh, which is why we don't. Uh, but uh, a better explanation or more politically um, correct explanation is that the next WDR is going to be on trade, so the effects of trade on um, development and immigration or migra migratory patterns will be part of that. Clearly, it's a big part of the story and many politicians, particularly in Europe, are very, very scared by... Um, uh, by exactly this topic of where are the jobs and if, you know, in North Africa and in, uh, in uh, the Middle East you're not creating jobs, these people are going to show up at our doorstep. So the rise of populism and nationalism in um, Europe, among many other uh, parts of the world, is precisely an answer to, um, um, to your uh, second comment. Quickly on the first um, uh, uh, comment of uh, where, so what's hap happening in jobs, so we just document uh, with evidence that the jobs that are created globally essentially either come to East Asia or are created and stay in East Asia. So this sort of traditional development where they would shift to poorer, so to speak, uh, countries, that's not happening at all. And actually that worries us uh, a lot because a lot of the storyline on uh, on uh, sort of the youth dividend in Africa is that, look, we have so many young people, jobs will come to them and we'll be super productive societies because we have more people than everybody else. In fact, what's happening is that there are many people um, in Africa and they have no jobs. So it's actually getting worse and worse and, um, uh, and worse. Um, so it's China, but it's, as I mentioned in our graph, it's Vietnam is created proportionately for the last 15 years, actually, uh, Vietnam is the number one country in the world in terms of creating the most formal jobs relative to where they um, started. We now see this phenomena going even down um, to other East Asian countries like Laos, like Cambodia, Myanmar, uh, actually Indonesia is starting to be part uh, of that. But we don't have, so we document it, but then the next more relevant question is why East Asia and why not other uh, regions? So we don't have a very good explanation. So human capital and the human capital uh, index, East Asian countries relative to their income per, per capita, as I showed you, outperform. So if it is about some mixture between human capital and technology, then it makes sense why it's here and not uh, elsewhere. Where we don't have sufficient yet analysis is what is the link between human capital and physical capital? Because that's also what defines uh, East Asia. So good ports, good airports, good uh, infrastructure, which is missing in Africa, is missing in large parts of um, uh, Latin America, is missing in the Middle East. So somehow this link between physical and uh, uh, human capital 
we think is the explanation, but we don't have a good explanation why it does not. So what is the recipe for having it in other parts of the world? Maybe you do? I unfortunately know. <laughs> uh, but um, actually, I need to ask if anybody else has any questions they would like to ask. Yes. Okay, let's make this our last question, and then we can wrap up. Uh, thank you very much. I'm a undergraduate student here at HUST. Um, you know, in recent years, many many people, for example, tech leaders and uh, economists and, and some politicians, are arguing that uh, you know automation is gonna replace a large amount of workforce. And um, some some part of it, and I think, is becoming reality. If you consider um, examples like self self driving cars, especially self driving trucks. Um, and uh, even if we we try to be optimistic that there will be some more jobs created by new technology, I believe there would be some friction in the workforce during this transformation. And so I want to ask, what what would be the be a good policy response in this transformation um, to address that uh, that friction? And um, another thing is, you know, recently a Chinese and American entrepreneur called Andrew Yang uh, announced that uh, he's, he's going to run for president in 2020. And uh, his main agenda is a policy of uh, universal basic income. So I want to ask, what's your, com what's your opinion on this kind of policy? And um, how would that impact our, you know, this capitalist, capitalist system? Maybe. Thank you. You could just give a brief answer, and then maybe he can talk to you later. Yep, uh, and I'd be interested in Simon's uh, view on UBI. So this is actually the first report that the World Bank tried to have a consensus on the topic universal basic income. So far, the World Bank tried to shy away from this topic because it's too uh, under research and controversial. In brief, my own view, which is not the view of the report, my own view is that universal basic income is like communism. It's a good idea, but actually once you apply it, it bombs. And in fact, there are only two countries, we have evidence of only two countries that have tried universal basic income across the whole population, Mongolia and Iran. So just when you know which these two countries are, you start suspecting that you know it's not such a great uh, idea. Both countries have natural resources, so they decided to have UBI um, um, uh, basically schemes in place. Within 15 months in the one case and 18 months in the other case, the systems went bankrupt. So they stopped it. So, so far, there is no, not a single case where a country has su succeeded in UBI. There are many failures. Finland recently stopped their program. These countries I mentioned went um, bankrupt. There is the hope that new technology can make it easier, and probably it's, uh, it's the case, but somehow we don't have the fundamentals of UBI uh, right. So my own view, unlike Bill Gates and this person that you meant, because Bill Gates is also very big on universal basic income. My view is that everybody who is hiding a lot of money from taxation is very supportive of universal basic income. <laughs> That's actually something I do have an opinion on. Um, so universal basic income, my opinion on that is if it comes at the cost of replacing existing services, then I think that's likely to be very, very costly. And if you're not going to replace existing services, social welfare services that governments provide, then I think financing the UBI is going to be very, very expensive. Um, uh, you know, so there's a big difference between giving people cash and giving people kind. And as an economist, we always argue that giving people cash allows them to choose the best uh, you know, consumption bundle that is best for them. Uh, but you know, that's in a perfect world, that's in textbook. Econ 101, which we know is not is not the real world, really. I mean, there are lots of information constraints, there are constraints of access, there are credit constraints, all kinds of things that prevent people from being able to buy the consumption bundles that they really need and that would actually improve their welfare. And so I think in-kind services continue, must continue to play a very important role, in, especially in developing countries. That's just my opinion. I'm sorry, we're out of time, uh, so we need to wrap up. I think if you have additional questions, um, Simon is can, I hope, be here for another few minutes, perhaps, and so can Simeon. I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, I also want to thank Simeon and uh, from his team, from the WDR team, Rong Chen, who is also here. I want to thank uh, Simon Cox, and I also want to thank Carla and Vivian and all our student helpers who've worked so hard to make this event come together. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.